Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Do you know God has a season for your life? God has a season for your life. And God doesn't care whether you're 80 or 90. He said, God, my season hasn't come yet. We'll keep living. God gave a season to Abraham at 80. God gave a season to Miriam at 92. Aaron at 90. Say, God has a season for me. That's important to understand that you may not have achieved or thought, you maybe I haven't done what God's asked me to do, maybe I haven't done the great thing God's asked me to do, but God says, I have a season for you. Keep living. Keep living in faith. Keep walking in faith. And maybe one day you'll see a burning bush and find out God has something greater and you're going to do more in the last season of your life than you ever did in the previous four seasons. So speaking of seasons, I, I want to go, yeah, everybody know who Miriam is? Yes. Moses' sister. Anybody know where Miriam was buried? I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to tell you today. So I want to read a little story about Miriam. And we love the story of Miriam. In fact, if you go to a Jewish wedding today, at the end of the wedding during the, during the festivals, you will do the dance of Miriam. Absolutely, we'll do the dance of Miriam. And it's a happy dance. It's a dance where God has brought them through the Red Sea. And so let's, let's, let's read what Miriam says. And Miriam the prophetess. Everybody say prophetess. So all those years that she was in slavery in Egypt, God had a season and a job waiting for her in the kingdom. Say, God has something for me. May not see it yet, but it's coming. So Miriam the prophetess of Israel, the sister of Aaron, which makes her the brother, sister of Moses. She took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, saying, Sing ye unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider hath he thrown into the sea. We all know that song. Everybody sing that song back in the 70s. You used to sing that. Just five of you? How long some of you been in church? So before we get to this next part, I, I, I want to ask you a question. God has now released the children of Israel. And he's all done it all through the hand of Moses. And Miriam has seen all this. She, in fact, she's seen her little brother now become the most important man in all of Israel. And she's seen her little brother become more powerful than Pharaoh of Egypt himself. In fact, the Bible says that Pharaoh was afraid of Moses. So with that anointing and that season that God is now, she's the prophetess of Israel. She's the praise and worship leader of the women's group. She probably has 300,000 women in her portion of the church. I mean, it don't get much better than that. She's in the inner sanctum. When God meets with Moses and Aaron, sometimes she's included. It can't get any better than that, can it? My goodness. My little brother is Moses. I don't care who she was. If you walk through the camp there of Israel, and you were Miriam, and you were walking through the camp of Israel, everybody looking at you like, man, that, that's Moses' sister. That's Miriam. We all know who she is. She's somebody. I fact, one of the most famous preachers in America today will tell you one of the reasons he has the ministry he has is because of his bigger sister. His bigger sister and what a blessing she's been to the ministry. So with all of that going for Miriam, there's nothing that could go wrong with this, is there? With all of that going, Moses' big sister, anointed, the prophetess of Israel, the praise and worship leader of the women's group. There's no way this could go wrong. No way this could go wrong. Well, let's read on. Now, there had been some discussion among the children of Israel. They were getting frustrated with God, and, and they were getting a little antsy, and they began to blame God for this experience in the wilderness, which the experience in the wilderness lasted because of God or because of them? It lasted because of them and their hearts. And because of the murmuring of the people, Miriam and, Moses, Moses, excuse me, Miriam and Aaron, Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethian woman whom he had married. And that really, that word is Cush, Cushite woman, whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses? And I have a lot of people ask me, Pastor, you always talk about this issue where God tells Aaron and, and, and Miriam, you don't know who you're talking to here. So here it is. So I'm preaching on this today. You've asked me and here it is. Hath the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses? Hath he not spoken to us also? And everybody say, and the Lord heard it. Lord. There's nobody you're talking about that God hasn't heard what you said about him. There's nobody you're talking about, especially brothers and sisters in Christ. 
that God doesn't hear it. We act, live, act like God doesn't care, but he, I, I'm here to tell you he cares. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, and come ye out three into the tabernacle of the congregation. They came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the front of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. <laughs> and they both come forward. How would like to be in that meeting? <laughs> How many want to be in that meeting there with God? <laughs> wow. And he said, hear now my words. He said, if there be a prophet among you, the Lord will make himself known unto him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. He said, my servant Moses, he's not that way. He's faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in darkness speeches, and similitudes of the Lord shall he behold before, for when then ye were not afraid to speak against Moses, my servant. You're not afraid to speak against Moses? You're not speaking? Because do you not understand when she spoke against Moses, she spoke against God. <laughs> and, and God says, you're a prophetess. Remember, you're a prophetess. And it's kind of like, you didn't see this one coming, did you? <laughs> you didn't think I was going to call you out on this, but God did. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Can you imagine that meeting? The cloud lifts, and, and, and Miriam is leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, Alas, my Lord, beseech, I beseech thee, lay not the sins upon us wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one that is dead, but whom the flesh is half consumed, and when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses, the man she just badmouthed, now he asked God to heal her. The man she just badmouthed asked God to heal her. That, that, brothers and sisters, is power. That is meekness. Yeah. That is what God has called us to do. You need to pray for those that are bad-mouthing you. That's what we're called to do. Three hand claps on that. No, that's what we're called to do. People are bad-mouthing you, pray for them. And Moses Christ, heal her, Lord. Oh, God, heal her. And God's answer is stunning. His answer is stunning. And the Lord said to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, should she... This is in your Bible, by the way. Should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days. And after that, let her be received again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not until Miriam was brought in again. So God puts Miriam in time out. Any of you ever put your kids in time out or your grandkids in time out? I put my kids in time out. I don't know how to put my grandkids in time out yet because that's just what happens to you as a grandparent. <laughs> They probably get make up for it when they go home. Man, Miriam, she's in the inner circle of God. Aaron is the high priest of Israel. Moses, her little brother, is the deliverer himself that God has handpicked. How could you have a problem with this situation? How could you be mad at your little brother or angry or jealous of your little brother? He just helped deliver you from Egypt and the oppression of Pharaoh. He sets you free. Anybody ever been mad at a God who sets you free? I don't want to show my hands on that. I'm here to tell you, the only one that can mess up your season and your calling and your anointing is you. The devil can't do it, God won't do it, but you can. And God says, I want you to understand this. Miriam does something that God says, I'm going to cut, shut down the movement of three million people over the sin of one woman. Three million people had to stop and camp and could not move on with God until God dealt with this woman. My question to you today is, who in your life is your sin causing people to have to camp and not move on with God? Oh, it's not going to be one of those happy sermons today. I know that. Everyone wants a happy sermon. Shout you happy. The problem is shouting you happy, I have to pray for you on Monday. If I preach you the truth and you have the truth of God in you, I won't have to pray for you all week long. So I can feel the excitement and the exuberance about this. So now I know it's from God. So if life is measured in times of terms of time, and it is. 
How old are you? It's measured in time. How long have you been married? Measured in time. Where did you go to school? How long did you go to school? All our games or sports are measured in time. We live days, weeks, and months. How long have you been on that job? It's all measured in time. So if everything in life is measured in time, and God is, time is a gift God has given, given you, then wasted time is self-abuse or self-neglect. We measure our short sojourn on this life with time. You don't believe me? Go to a cemetery, look at the tombstones. I never realized that until my mother and father passed away. And every tombstone, it's, it's dated. Date of birth, date of death. So why did God create time when he lives in eternity? A lot of people ask me that. Well, Ecclesiastic 1, 1 through 3 tells us. The time was created for purpose to be fulfilled. Everybody say, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. And God says, I'm going to give you time to fulfill that purpose. So your time was created for your purpose to be revealed and fulfilled in the earth. And so if it's a thing, according to the word of God, it has a season. And every season under heaven, the Bible says, has a time. God is saying everything that he has created has a purpose, and that purpose is to which it was created. It has a time stamp on it. Do you know your life has a time stamp on it? Yeah. I don't want to blow your minds, but each and every one of you in this room, your life has a time stamp on it. And God says, I have something for you to do, and I've created, given you time and purpose to be that fulfilled in your life. What an amazing thing. God says, I'm going to give you time to fulfill what I have called you to do. So there is a time when that thing is supposed to happen and be fulfilled. Miriam, God has you here for this time and this moment and this hour. You're in the inner circle. You are living in a place most people would just dare, just dare or even dream to be in. Yes, yes. The position you're in with Abraham, with not Abraham, sorry, Moses and with Aaron, with God. Could you imagine if God had a meeting after this and I got to come to the meeting, my wife got to come to the meeting and you got to come to the meeting? God himself shows up and talks to him. So there's a time for you, and you were born for that time and purpose, and you don't have forever to fulfill it. What you get is a season when God took you out of eternity, placed you in time. He locked you into a season, which you mean, means you don't have time to waste time. Time doesn't wait for you to discover your purpose. If you don't know why you were born, time will still move on and march on. So time was given to manifest seasons of our lives. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. God has given you time to operate in your season. You know, God's question when you at the, at the pearly gates is not how old are you, it's what do you do with the time I gave you? The conclusion of the Christian believer, of the Christian and the judgment of the believer at the Bema is not well said, it's well done. What did you do with the time I gave you? You were born for a purpose and it has a time stamp. And the problem with that is it makes you 100% responsible for your life. Ouch. I, I want somebody else to be responsible for my life. I don't want to be responsible for my decisions and the result of my decisions. And how is this achieved spiritually that we make the most of the time that God has given us? It's achieved through spiritual maturity in Jesus Christ and responsibility to his word. That's how it's achieved. If God has you here, you have a purpose. And God says, for you to achieve that purpose and fulfill that in time, you're going to find it in God's word. You need to read this word, study this word, show this word approved unto God in your heart so that you know what God thinks about you, what he says about you, so that you have an idea what he thinks about you, what you think about him. And God said, this is what is going to tell you what you're supposed to do with your time. Yes. I'm not going to come to your house and read the Bible to you. I'm not going to do that. In fact, Jesus Christ himself ain't even going to come to your house and read the Bible to you. God is asking you to pick up the Bible and read it. Amen. So say, my life has a time stamp. If you don't believe me, just go visit your parents in the grave. My life has a time stamp. I believe God's goal in this season is spiritual maturity in the church. I believe he's demanding it. I believe that God is demanding the church in America become the church and the bride of Christ it's supposed to be. Yeah. I believe the church, if you look at America, is a microcosm of what the church has become. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you, there were two movements that started in the 1970s. One was a charismatic movement in the church. Anybody remember the charismatic movement, the charismatic renewal that happened in the 70s? But there was also another movement that happened in the 70s. Anybody know what it was? It was a new age movement called the Age of Enlightenment. 
They happen exactly the same time. Satan always patterns what God does. He will always have, he will always have a fake pattern after what God does. So when God poured out the Holy Spirit in the 70s, Satan poured out new age. The age of enlightenment. And now we have people in churches praying to the universe. We pray here to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't pray to a universe that God created. I pray to the God who created the universe. But there are churches right now in America that have Christian on their name, but they're praying to the universe. So let's look over the church over the last 50 years. And if you tell me between the church and New Age movement in America, tell me which one's had more effect in this country in the last 50 years. Let's be honest here, okay? We've got an excited group of people with very little depth. Don't kid yourself. Very little depth. Christians are the most easy offended group I've ever seen in my life. We've seen some amazing anointings and great disappointings. We have fancy music, but sometimes false worship. I know churches on this mountain where you can go lift your hands and praise God and worship God. And you can be in the ministry team or you can be leadership and you can believe in abortion and abortion's okay. I'm not lying to you about that. We speak Christianese, but we don't pray on our knees. We want power without principle. Flashy without faith. We, we got churches, we got lights, smokes and mirrors. And darken it all up and get the smoke screen. Smoke, what's that thing called? The smoke machine going? We got great programs that don't bring God's presence. We have unbelievable youth programs. That don't last one year after the kid's out of high school. Over 95% of the children in youth programs that were in youth programs all their life in church are not even serving God one year after. Read the Barna study. I'm just, I'm just telling you what the Barna group said. One year after high school, all that praise and worship, all that entertainment, all that teaching didn't amount to nothing. And I'm going to tell you why. Do you really want to know why? Because God's standard for a youth program is a godly father and a godly mother raising their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. No program can, no program can change that. No program a man will ever change that aspect. And to prove it, my, bro, my three older brothers, they were in a church with youth programs. And they're all serving God. Me, my little brother, and my sister, the church didn't have a youth program. We had a church split. And my youth program was my mommy and my daddy. And my, me and my little brother and my sister, all serving God. What's the common denominator? A godly father, a godly mother. That raised their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you, you, you can say, well, pastor, are you mad? No, I'm telling you the truth about the church and where we're at. God has given us anointings and giftings. And he's saying, don't mess this up. God won't mess them up. The Satan will try. But you are the only one that can mess up your anointing, your gifting, and your season in the earth. You're the only one. Don't believe me. Ask Saul. We're experts at having meetings, yet we have difficult meeting with God. The reality is the New Age concept preys on the minds of illiterate Christians. And we have Christians leaving the church, moving to New Age time and time again, and slipping out of the kingdom, slipping out of the church. I'm not saying they're out of the kingdom, but they're slipping out of the church because they are illiterate to the Word of God. Let me tell you how dangerous being illiterate to the Word of God is. Eve did God say. I'm telling you, being illiterate to God's Word opens the door for the devil to come up and mess with your mind. That's true. That's true. Spiritually illiterate. Satan's like, man, I can mess with her. She don't even know the Word of God. All right, I can feel the enthusiasm. <laughs> I just wish more pastors would preach the truth. Right. You turn on your TV today, all you're going to get is pablum. Right. I didn't say who, I just said you're going to get. There's a couple on there that are pretty good. But I think that it's time to get rid of all the powdered milk and sour milk formula in the church. And demanding the children of God begin eating on the meat of the Word of God. And if you eat on the meat of the Word of God, you'll begin to act and live like you're eating on the meat of the Word of God. The church is almost 2,000 years old. Think about that. And we still got gossiping and bickering and competing jealousies. 2,000 years old, we're still hating one another. Comparing ourselves with each other, competing. Petty jealousies. Petty jealousies. Let me tell you something. When I meet with pastors, you know the number one question they ask me within the first five minutes? What's the number one question they ask me in the first five minutes? Pastors, I don't know. How many people do you have in your church? Number one question in five minutes. I'll get that. And I mess with their minds. And I say, we only have one. And they, they I do. I, 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 this is, and I, they're, they're like, you only got one person? 
And I said, yes, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's the one person in the church that I care about. If I get him right, you'll get right. That's a fact. I've only got one. Yeah, I love their faces. One. <laughs> Pastors are so easy to mess with. You can mess with a religious spirit just like that. So in the church, we have all kinds of issues. Jealousies, backbiting. Deadbeat spiritual fatherhood. Deadbeat spiritual husbands. It's horrible. As a matter of fact, you know, the church is adolescent. And Jesus isn't coming back for a young girl. He's coming back for a virtuous woman. Your Jesus is coming back for a virtuous woman. You're not coming back for a young girl. Oh, I praise God. Virtuous woman. I believe God is demanding us we grow up, and growing up means responsibility. Responsibility. Say with me, responsibility. Responsibility, responsibility to God. Responsibility to His Word. Responsibility to each other. Responsibility to your families and your children and to your marriage. God demands responsibility. And I'm going to tell you the lack of re responsibility is the word called irresponsibility. And God despises that. How many of you hated it when your children were irresponsible? Just three of you. The rest of you, I praise God for your kids. I believe it's a very pervasive characteristic in our society in America today. It's so pervasive. And I'm going to define irresponsibility to you. And it's going to take a while. No answerable, not answerable to authority. You see that in America today? Lacking a sense of accountability. I'm not accountable to anybody. <laughs> I'm not accountable. Okay. All right, Miriam. God bless you. <laughs> Unable to respond to conscience. Abortion's okay. Fickle, flighty, thoughtless. Rash, undependable, unstable, loose and lax immorality. Untrustworthy. This is one of my favorite ones. A perpetual victim. It's unpredictable. You never know what they're going to do next. You ever, ever, ever meet people, you have no idea what they're going to do next. It means no vision. I'm talking about the spiritual nature of this word from the Hebrew and the Greek. It means wild and unreliable. And here's my favorite one. To transfer blame for their problems and behavior to someone else. And right now, the entire nation, the entire America, and even the church is under this destructive influence of irresponsibility. No one wants to take responsibility for their actions, their decisions, their situations, or their circumstances today. We are experts at blaming everybody else. Your blamer-in-chief says your high gas prices are Vladimir Putin's reason, and he's the problem. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie from the pit of hell. All the oil he released, he released it to China and India, not to you. So we have a commander-in-chief who's a blamer-in-chief. Experts blame the past for their presence. Blame their parents for their habits. We blame our teachers for our ignorance. We blame cops as criminals, really. We blame our pastors for our problems that are cynical because of church. No, if you're cynical, it's because you have a bad heart. Check the Word of God out. We blame our sickness on corporations. Parents, we blame our children for the society we live in. Children blame the parents. We blame corporations for greed and corruption, yet we buy every stupid little gadget they make. We blame our problems for our addictions. Husbands blame their wives for their waywardness. Wives blame their husbands for their bitterness, angerness, resentment, depression. The poor blames the rich for their poverty. And the races blame each other for their misery. We live in an, it's an unbelievable, irresponsible generation and time in the earth. We live in a generation that believes they are owed everything and everything is supposed to be given to them for free. That's irresponsible to God and His Word. I read in here six days, shalt thou work. Work's a four-letter word to a lot of people today, even in the church. God says, I'll bless the work of your hand. You've got to get up and go to work. You want and pray, come and ask me to pray for God to bless you financially. I'll pray God gives you a job. God said, I want you to have a church where every person underneath the sound of your voice is saved, born again, filled with the Spirit, and going to heaven. I will not ever want to be accused of you didn't preach the word. You preached pablum and you preached a friendly gospel that says, hey, you're okay. And you are okay as long as you have Jesus and the Holy Spirit and have the word of God in your life. Absolutely. 
So here we are in America. I can't even turn on the news anymore because I can't stand to read the headlines every morning. Spiritually, it makes me almost want to vomit. To think I have grandchildren or granddaughters now that are dealing with the situation, they're going to go to school and be told, you don't know what gender you are yet, we'll tell you what you are. Good Lord Almighty, help us. Sinners blame the church as being hypocrites for their damnation. You see, I read a scripture that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's not my job. That's not my job. That's your job to work out your own salvation. Paul says it. Now, he would know it. <laughs> Do we transfer wrong actions to the society we live in? We're in trouble. And we know where this irresponsibility came from. Genesis 3, 9 through 13 at the fall, the fall of man. What happened in the fall was three things got introduced. Fear, jealousy, and irresponsibility to God's word. It entered into the world there, no question. And when God came down and said, Adam, we're on you, it was not a question of location. It was disposition. Adam, you're out of position. What did you do, Adam? And the amazing thing is God had to come and ask Adam, what did you do? Where are you? And Adam's son Cain, God had to come to him and say the same thing. What did you do? Where's your brother? Don't tell me your actions don't affect those coming after you. They do. And God has an answer for that in his word. You can break the cycle of damnation over your family and curses, family curses. You can break it in Jesus' name. But you're not going to do it without the Holy Spirit and the word of God. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's going to take work. Everybody say it's going to work. There's that four-letter word, spiritual work. So it's where it's all started. God comes down and Adam, what'd you do? And what did Adam do? He pointed at Eve and said, well, is that woman you gave me? <laughs> Absolute fact. God goes to Eve and said, Eve, what did you do? And Eve said, the devil made me do it. My favorite one is when Moses came off the mountain with the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel are naked running around a golden calf. And Moses says to Aaron, what did you do? And he said, well, you're not going to believe this. But the people said we need a God and they gave me their gold and I fashioned this gold through it and the fire and this calf walked out. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking about irresponsibility to God. Aaron said, I didn't do it. The people made me do it. That was King Saul's problem. I didn't do it. The people made me do it. Everybody say blame. Blame. Blame is a dangerous thing. Blame. Satan will use blame. Oh my goodness. So God's like, oh, oh man. Thank God he had a plan. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Thank God he had a plan. And the reality is nothing is worse spiritually than artificial growth. How many, how many when you buy your meat now and your chicken and your meat, you, you make sure it's hormone free? Anybody of you smart enough to do that? Science has found out that we live in the tallest generation of humanity that has ever lived, other than, other than the Nephilim. But at this point, we understand, and you, you know what scientists have said the issue is? All of the hamburger kids, the kids, the hamburger the kids ate at McDonald's that had growth hormone in it. See, I, I, I'm, I'm Western enough to spend a lot of time in the woods, and, and I remember in the days when we, every cow out there had a little tag on its ear. And it wasn't an earring. <laughs> it was growth hormone. It was growth hormone. You can't mess with rednecks. We know what's going on. Artificial growth. It's dangerous. The children of Israel, they were delivered from Egypt. And Miriam is my, Miriam is my example today. She's in this place. She has come through the Red Sea. She's seen the fire by day, the fire by night, the cloud by day. She's seen God work immeasurably in miracle and power. She's delivered, but she's not free. Delivered people are dangerous because they're not free. And you need to hear this. Let me tell you why delivered people, they confuse deliverance with freedom. But delivered people are dangerous because they haven't changed inside. All they did was change location. And Miriam, bless her heart, she's in Egypt, and she's a slave in Egypt, and I'm sure it was bitter, and I'm sure it was hard, and I'm sure it made her angry, and I'm sure it made her hateful, and she's in Egypt, and now God releases her from the captivity and slavery of Egypt. Her baby brother, man, now he is running the show. She's in the inner circle. She 
She is saved, but she's still angry. She's still hateful. She's still jealous. She's still a gossiper. She's a slander. She's a complainer and a murmur. My goodness, can you believe? This is Moses' sister. This is the prophetess of Israel. She's not in slavery anymore. She's, she's got delivered, but she's not free in her spirit, not her soul yet. Ouch. You live in church long enough, you'll see this. I'm born again, bless God, but still dealing with the problems I had before I was born again. So I did a study on this, and I wanted to find out. And so if you want to really want to study the Word of God, you're going to have to get into the Jewish teaching and the Jewish writing and the writing of the Jewish sages and Jewish, Jewish elders. And, and I found out, where did this jealousy start? Because the sin that Miriam committed against Abraham, Moses, I don't know why I got Abraham on my mind. The sin she committed against Moses was rebellion. Yes. See, the Bible tells us that God has come to set us free from our sin. Not sins, plural. Our sin. Everybody say sin. Read it in the New Testament. It never says sins. It says sin. David said, Lord, you have forgiven me of my sin. But then we have iniquities. So all sin is rebellion. Iniquities are what come out of rebellion. So what she did, her rebellion was against Moses and God. The iniquity was jealousy and blame. And she didn't even know that God heard her say that. And she's a prophetess. <laughs> I ain't believing in any of her prophecies. <laughs> Steve, I want to prophesy over you. No, thank you, Miriam. <laughs> you didn't see this one coming. God bless you. I'm not sure about your anointing as a prophetess. God calls her up short, puts her in time out. So I did a study on this in relation to the Jewish writers. And, and do, you, do you remember when Moses was born? And, and, and it's back in Exodus 2. We're not going to turn there. But the Bible says that when Moses was born, he was a, he was a beautiful child. He's a good-looking boy. The Bible says he, he's a good-looking little duffer. And the Bible says that his mother, Yoshebel, she made an ark and she put him in the ark and she set him free. But then read on. It says it was his sister that stood there and watched. Not his mother. Everybody say sister. sister. So with big sister standing there that as they put the ark in the river, his mother couldn't bear it. She must have gone back in the house. It was Miriam that stood there and watched that. And I'm sure as, as time went by that she had helped her mother take care of Moses as a baby. She was about 12 years old at this time. At 12 years old, she would have been required to help her mother. She would have been held, required to help her mother hide the Hebrew babies from the Egyptians when they came looking for the babies. And the Egyptians figured some stuff out how to find the Hebrew babies because the Hebrews had learned how to make their babies be quiet. I'm not going to tell you how they do it, but they, they, they find a way. In the Native American society, it exists in the Native American society the same way. But what the Egyptians realized is these, these Hebrews hide their babies so well, we're, we're going we're to really mess with them. They would bring in Egyptian babies that would begin to coo and talk. And guess what would happen to the Hebrew babies? They would begin to coo and talk. Can you believe that program that says it's okay just to throw babies away and throw them in the river and sacrifice them? Uh, okay, I'm talking about Egypt, but in America we throw babies away and sacrifice them every day. I mean, we think we're better than them, though. So I'm sure she had to help raise Moses. I'm sure she, she was required at times to hold him and to cuddle him and take care of that little boy. She puts him in the river. Her mother does, and then her mother... The Bible clearly says it was Miriam that stood afar off and watched. The sister. And I'm sure it was profound that when she saw the ark float down, and it floated down up into some reeds, and God just happened to have... Say, God just happened to have... Do you know God just happens to have victory for your children that you think are lost? Victory for your children you think are going to serve God? God just happens to have somebody waiting there to help them. And Pharaoh's daughter, who we are pretty sure was barren, according to Bible scholars I read, she looked at that baby in the Bible and said she fell in love with that little baby. Women and babies. Everybody say women and babies. The survival of the species depends on women and babies. I'm going to tell you that right now. There's no way God let us be. And she fell in love with that little baby, and, and Miriam was watching this. And so Miriam would have seen that, and she sees the baby taken to Pharaoh's daughter. And she comes up, and she does a great thing. She said, would you like me to find a Hebrew mother that could take care of this baby? She praised God. 
God arranges a situation where Yoshebel gets to raise her little baby boy for five years. Gets to nurse the boy and wean him at five years old. And you know good and well, Miriam was part of that process. And then one day at five years old, they have to take the baby to Pharaoh's daughter. And they see him go from a pauper to a prince of Egypt in one day. And now she gets to watch her little baby brother be raised in royalty. And now she's a slave and her little baby brother is a prince. Now I begin to see what may have happened to this poor girl. I'm still in slavery. I saved the baby. I did everything I could do. Lord, don't you know what I did, Lord? If it wasn't for me, this whole thing would be over. There would not be a deliverer. Look what I did, and I'm still in slavery. So you know the rest of the story. Forty years old, Moses tries to help his brother, but he tries to do it the wrong way. So we already understand God says you're a deliverer, but Moses thinks he's going to see to kill an Egyptian. And God says, no, 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 no. So Moses has to run for his life. And so for any of you that are over 75 years old, I got good news for you. God's looking for you to get to 80. <laughs> if you're over 80, God's looking for you to get to 92. Because that's when he called Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So we're going to do this thing. And God, God said, I need all three of you. And Hebrew scholars will tell you that is probably where the spirit of jealousy entered her life. About her little baby brother. Any of you ever been jealous of your brother or sister? I remember one time my neighbor gave my little brother a bike. And at 10 years old when your little 8 year old brother gets a stingray bike and it's all cherried out and it's so beautiful. I got jealous of that bike. And what really chapped me is I could only ride it when he would let me. <laughs> so I had to kiss his derriere all the time so I could ride his bike. Because that's the way it works. So Moses now he'll come back and he's more powerful than he ever was. And Miriam gets to watch all this. He marches right into Pharaoh's court and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says no and the miracles commence. And Miriam sees all these miracles God pours out. My goodness. All ten plagues were a miracle. The hand of, and they came through Moses. It was Moses that said, you get a lamb and you put the lamb, that blood on your doorpost and then on the sign of the cross. It was Moses at the Red Sea, part of the Red Sea, by faith. She's seen it all. And all of these blessings came through Moses' ministry. And now she's in her season and her time and God has brought her along with the process with her brothers. She's the prophetess of Israel, the sister of Moses himself. You can't get any more closer to the pinnacle of power of Israel. But she wants it all. Something lurking in her past. She has a good, but she wants it all. She wants what little brother has. That's kind of like Satan. Remember the Bible says Satan, he looked at the throne of God and he said, I want it all. That's the spirit of jealousy. I want it all. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16 that we got to deal with three things. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And even in the test of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, these were the three things that the God said, I need to know by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, can you handle this test before you go into public ministry? Read your Bible. The Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. God needed to know, can you pass the test of what the authority and dominion I'm about to give you? The lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And he passed all three of them by just whipping out the word of God on the old devil. I watched Jesus beat a new Old, old Testament devil with the Old Testament word. Don't tell me the Old Testament isn't power. If it's powerful to beat, beat the devil in the wilderness, it's powerful to beat him in show today. But she has something working in her past. The enemy knows it. My goodness. Come on, girl. What else do you want? See, in Egypt, she had the security of welfare because it was absence of responsibility. That's why people love welfare, because you don't have to be responsible to anybody. But freedom is an attribute of God. And true freedom comes from God, who exercises exact responsibility in our lives. Let me tell you how much freedom God has. He could have let us all just go. But responsibility says, I created you, so now I'm going to find a way and make a way to save you. That is the power of your God and his responsibility to the creation of humanity. 
So deliverance isn't freedom. It's, it's, it's a release from the oppressor. But freedom is deliverance from the oppression. Yes. As long as you're oppressed, you can always blame the oppressor. Problem is when you're free and Jesus said those that are free are free indeed. You can't blame anybody. You are now responsible yourself. Say, I'm responsible for myself. My words and my actions. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew, he said, you'll be judged by your words. Whether good or bad, he said, you're going to be judged by them. Can you imagine standing in that judgment of the beam with Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to talk over everything you've said? Wait a minute, why did everybody look down? We've got quite a church mouse in here. <laughs> Miriam has seen all this. She's delivered from Egypt, but she's not free in her spirit. And I agree with the Bible scholars and the Hebrew Bible scholars that when did this jealousy set in? I believe it started a long time ago in her life. Do you know the enemy will come against you to mess with you early in life, so you'll have to deal with the pain of something all the days of your life. And it'll affect your anointing, your calling, your gifting. It'll affect everything in your life. He has a design for that. So when things get a little tough, irresponsibility, she and Aaron get together and they blame Moses and God for the problems in the children of Israel. And she literally attacks the character of God. And God says, you're upset with the man I chose? You're acting just like you did back in Egypt. You're acting just like you did. You're upset with the Egyptians all the time. They tell you what to do every day. And you hate them and you despise them. And now you're delivered, but you're not free. And all Moses is telling you to do is what God is telling him to tell you to do. And you got a problem with that? God puts her in time out. Anybody ever, God ever put you in time out? God tells you you're acting just like you did back in Egypt. And she goes from blame and jealousy to rebellion. And it all stems out of rebellion. She has it good, but she wants it all. So the prophetess who is a seer is now being seen for who she really is. And now the very man she attacks says, I'm going to pray for you, girl. You angry with me? You're jealous of me? I'm going to pray for you. Now you understand the meekness and the spirit of Moses and why God chose Moses. Says, and he cries out to God, God. Heal her. God tells him, no. I won't heal her for seven days. And then God says something that's amazing. He said, if her father had spit in her eyes, she would have been, in, she would have been embarrassed and put out of the camp for seven days. If her father had spit in her eye. She's anointed. She's called. It's her season. Miriam, only you can. The devil can't do it. Only you can mess this up, girl. Your brother's Moses. And God tells her to his face. <laughs> You're a prophetess and you didn't perceive this. Let me tell you the difference between Moses and Miriam. Moses never was a slave. And he never came into the kingdom with a slave mentality. He never came into the kingdom with a slavery mentality. I, I praise God for that. Because that made him capable of leading all these people out. Bringing the plan of God, the plan of salvation, through the law of Moses and through the tabernacle. We have all that because of Moses today. Amen. So, you say, well, Pastor Steve, that's Moses. Talking about Moses, that would be bad. Well, can I read you what New Testament says about what you are? You're in the same category as Moses. He hath made us kings and priests unto our God. So when you're talking about somebody, you're talking about a king and a priest, somebody anointed of God, and God says, I don't want you bad mouth him, I don't want you talking about it. Better be careful what you say about a pre-king and a priest unto God. Yeah. God, God looks at you just the way he looks at Moses. God's not a respecter of persons. That's why God has to make his new creatures in Christ to get rid of the old critters. That's why God has to do that. Say, I'm a new creation in Christ. Because that Miriam, that old angry, jealous you has got to go and it's got to be dealt with. Right. Say, I'm a new creature in Christ. <laughs> wow. So I'm going to read something to you. So we all know the song of Miriam, right? 
It's not the song of Miriam. She co-opted it. She stole it from her brother. I'm going to prove it to you right now. So in Exodus 15, after they crossed the Red Sea, Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. Ever been in a church where the praise and worship leader was one of those people that wanted to be on American Idol? <laughs> you ever, ever seen that in a church? You don't see it here, but I, I tell you, I've been in churches where I was looking for Simon Cowell and the rest of the people. Where, where, where are they? And Mary and the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Mary answered them, Sing ye unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider hath thrown into the sea. That song has been attributed to Mary, Miriam, for 2,000 years. But can I read your Bible? So let's go back in the same chapter, verse 1, chapter 15. They just crossed the Red Sea. They just crossed the Red Sea. Pharaoh has been destroyed, delivered, his army's gone. The enemies they saw before, they will see no more. Exodus 15, 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. Then sang Moses. Get a Dake's Bible, it'll tell you Moses wrote this. It's not the song of Mary, it's the song of Moses. And she co-opted it. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take them out and I'm going to sing this song with these girls. But, but let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. They already sang it with Moses. Let me read it again. You missed it. And then sang Moses and the children of Israel. This song unto the Lord and spake saying, I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare for him a habitation. My father's God and I will exalt him. Moses wrote it. They sang the whole congregation and Miriam says, I'm going to jump on top of that and I'm going to take that. I'm going to take the women out. They'd already sang it. Moses had wrote it and she co-opted it. Jealousy is a terrible thing. So when you read the Hebrew writers that I read, and I read a lot of Hebrew writing, I knew there was something in her past that had messed her up. Why would, why would she want to? I'm going to go talk to God about Billy Graham. <laughs> Not me. I'm just trying to put it in perspective. How, how could you... So she literally loses face. She's embarrassed, and, and God, God, it's amazing. God, God does it publicly. And the devil didn't make her do it. Aaron didn't make her do it. And, and, and the Hebrew writers will tell you that, well, why didn't Aaron get busted like she did? Because she's the one that instigated it. So let me tell you where she's, born, where she's buried today. You got to read on. I'm not going to tell you where it is. I'm going to make you search it out. But this really upset God. Miriam, you're anointed. You're called. You are my woman. You're my gal. You're running with the, the three people that God thinks the most of on the whole face of the earth. You're in the inner circle, inner sanctum of heaven. And you have an attitude towards your brother and me. So a few chapters later, anybody remember the children of Israel where they, the original sin was of the original rebellion of Israel against God? Anybody remember where that happened at? A little place called Kadesh Barnea. And we all know that where you, you go when you go around the mountain, you just go around the same mountain and you, you just go around. And Miriam had been going around that same mountain time and time and time again in her life. God saying, Marion, let's deal with this jealousy. Nope, I'm good. Next time they come around the mountain, Miriam, let's deal with his jealousy. Nope, I'm good. And she never dealt with it. Just, just jealousy. I'm telling you right now, you talk about an inroad for the devil. Wow. You know, the Bible says they went around that mountain 40 years. Miriam, you want to deal with the jealousy this year? No? Okay. Mary, you want to deal with the jealousy this year? I'm good, God. See, you'll go around the, around the same mountain until you deal with it. I don't want to tell you, the time to deal with it in life is now. 
That was the day of salvation. And Miriam never dealt with us. So you know what God had, you know what God had Moses do? A few chapters later, she passes away. And God has Moses bury Miriam at Kadesh Barnea. He said, if you're going to just be bitter and jealous and, and hateful, and then you're not going to change, and I've given you time to change, I gave you 40 years to change this girl. I said, okay. That's where she's buried today. Her headstone there today, it says, couldn't ever get over my jealousy of Moses. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to live like this. We don't have to be jealous. We don't have to be bitter. We don't have to be angry. Let it go. Let it go. Isn't there a song called that? My little girl, my granddaughter sings it. Let it go or something like that. Just got to let it go. Say, I just got to let it go. I'm telling you, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Father, today I just pray. God, I, I know Miriam's in heaven today. I know she is. I know she's there with Aaron. I know she's there with Moses. And I know her heart's perfect before you. But Lord, what a shame to be called to the pinnacle of your anointing, your season in life. That God had set it up. Girl, at 92, I'm going to take you and make you one of the most important women in Israel. My goodness. I'm just asking today, if there's anything you need to let go of, you need to let it go today. Don't let your past curse your future. Don't let your past do it. Don't let it do it. Father, I just pray if anybody in the sound of my voice is dealing with this, just, Father, we'll have prayer afterwards up for people who want prayer for that. But don't let your past curse your future. Champion your brothers and sisters in Christ. Cheer for them, pray for them, bless them, be good to them, be nice to them, be kind to them. You never know that there might be a day they save your life. If you receive it, say amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The only prayer directly from heaven in God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. Think about those words. The Lord, God of creation, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you, give you his peace. Yes. And then God told him, he says, if you're children of Israel, you put your name on my children, I'll seek them. Yes. Because I'm in covenant with you. Amen. If you don't believe me, ask Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, amen. Manasseh, and Ephraim. I'm the God of covenant. If you receive it, say amen. amen. God bless you, you're dismissed. Hello one and all, we have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook, link is in the description, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter, link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed week.